crowd gathers at Westcott's Quay for the unveiling of a plaque marking a dramatic piece of St Ives history. At 8 o'clock one late September evening, a ship dropped anchor about 200 yards behind Smeaton's Pier, near the remains of the ill-fated New or Wood Pier. That ship was a former Royal Navy minesweeper seeking shelter from a very severe weather forecast. The year was 1952. What happened next captivated St Ives for several days, but until now there was no visible commemoration of those dramatic times. The man most responsible for rectifying this oversight witnessed the events first hand. The HMS wave incident in St Ives is a, a rare event here, not, not the least of which is that a, a ship grounded on the Cornish rocks and actually came off again to sail in the Royal Navy. Six WAVE veterans were able to attend the ceremony. At 5.21am on September the 30th, WAVE's starboard anchor chain broke under the strain of a Force 9 wind and she was driven into the sand in front of the Men and More rocks. The port anchor had not been used. With hindsight, if she had dropped anchor further out, there may have been the 20 minutes necessary for the ship to get up steam and sail to safety. Within six or seven minutes, Wave had run aground in the sand. Commander Robert Everett was asked how far he was from the shore. His memorable reply? I'm actually part of the shore. Dan Daly recalls the moment when he discovered something was not quite right. Well, half past four, we went and got to a bit. And the next thing I knew was somebody shaking and said, come on, the ships are gone. Which is what they normally do uh, at, at half past seven. Right? And, and I just told them where to go. And I, the voice sunk into me. I thought, that's the chief, don't get At 6.15, David Uren of the St Ives Lifesavers Association fired a breeches boy line towards the stranded ship in preparation for a rescue. The first line snagged on one of the Arts Club's chimneys but his second attempt found the target. Cables were run to the pier to stop her from drifting onto the rocks near Westcott's Quay. But this was never likely to succeed and they quickly snapped as the ship began to move with the first flood tide at around 11 o'clock. Shortly after noon, Commander Everett tried to refloat Wave but it was hopeless. At 12.30 he bowed to the inevitable and gave the order for the Breaches Boy rescue mission to begin. Here we can see the line to the ship and Coast Guard Harry Barlow trying to make himself heard above the storm. With the port anchor deployed, 62 of Wave's crew were to be evacuated immediately. 36 men were left on board to maintain the ship's essential services. Eight of the ship's non-swimmers went first, starting with electrician's mate Ray Sadler. Around 100 townspeople held the line, which stretched to the bottom of Street and Pole. With the ship being battered by the huge waves, they paid out or pulled the line to keep it taut and clear of the foaming seas. Inevitably, some of the crew took an involuntary dip, as Stoker Brian Sandham recalls. Tell me what it's like when you got onto deck and you were about to do Bridges Boy and they're all here. And you, you t tell me that feeling I'm coming across. Well, well it, it, the waves were coming, it was exhilarating, really. And I thought I've never been on one of these before. But I had no fear whatsoever. But because because the, the, the weather was so bad and the ship was was going up and down like this, the people here had to give with it, which is why they didn't fasten it to something. They could probably have fastened it to that chimney up there or something. But it would have just pulled the chimney off. And because the ship was going up there, the, the people had to give with it. And they were giving with it like this one as they gave. So you tipped in if you were unlucky. But um, yeah, it, was, it was a really, really wonderful rescue. It really was. As the wind became a Force 9 gale, Wave began to move. And at 2.30, she was holed below the waterline, rupturing the oil tank. After a short break to reposition the breeches boy, the process continued from the stern with the last man coming ashore at 4.15. Most of the men were soaked to the skin and covered in oil, but the hazardous operation had been successful. The rescue mission accomplished, thoughts quickly turned to the salvage operation.
The following day brought much calmer conditions, but hopes that Wave might be freed from the rocks by the 3.46am high tide were not realised, and the national press were pessimistic about her chances of being saved. By sheer good fortune, the next few days saw the tides coming on, that is, getting progressively higher, and all efforts concentrated on lightening the thousand-ton ship, using a thirty-strong human chain. With oil covering the rocks, even this was a hazardous task. Gouge marks made by heavy equipment dragged up these steps are still just about visible today. With the engine room flooded and the oil tank pierced, it was clear she could not move without outside help. So it was decided to secure a boom defence vessel to the pier, which would pull the ship off the rocks. Berthing a large ship like that required a pilot of supreme skill. Luckily, St Ives had just such a man. The boom defence vessel HMS Barberstall arrived at Sweetness Pier in pitch darkness. The 900 ton vessel had been sent from Plymouth to hopefully haul wave off the rocks with a twin ship, HMS Barnaby. She had to be guided into the harbour at once. St Ives pilot Richard Daniel Painter volunteered to bring her in. In an astonishing act of bravery, Richard Painter clambered up the wet, slippery hull of the Barberstall in heavy seas and piloted her safely to Sweetness Pier. For this, he was awarded the Queen's Commendation for Brave Conduct. The first attempt at refloating using HMS Barberstell's special hauling winches appeared to have no effect, but the dawn revealed the ship had moved about 20 feet, giving access to a hole big enough to drive a car through, and that that hole was large enough for a flotation balloon to be inserted into the lower hull. With the balloon inflated, and over 450 50 gallon drums in the hull, the salvage team were confident the second attempt would succeed. With the help of another boom defence vessel, HMS Barnaby, Wave is pulled towards the pier at 4.25. Onlookers held their breath as the initial list of 10 degrees slowly increased to 15 as she moved across the harbour. At this stage there was still a chance she might keel over. Soon cheers and applause rang out around the harbour as the Royal Navy reclaimed its minesweeper. All that now remained was for Wave and Barberstell to swap places at the pier. Now secure, Wave's hull was shored up for the journey to Devonport Dockyard. On the tow to Plymouth, the port anchor chain also parted. But she arrived at Devonport on the 8th of October and was soon back in the Fisheries Protection Service. Finally meeting her end in 1962 at J.J. King Shipbreakers, Gateshead. This story may have quickly faded from the public eye, but those most directly involved never forgot St Ives or its people. I was a 20 year old in those days, still as good looking as I am now, <laughs> but I never forgot St Ives and as I said in the hall, I've been coming down since I left the Navy in 1972, twice a year down to Cornwall. Not always staying in St Ives, but we always, I always visited St Ives. I always went to the museum. I always came down here. We are here with the HMS Wave veterans to mark this memorable act of collective and individual courage and pay tribute to those who took part. Some of you were on the lines and will be here today. You were heroes that day and I'm certain you are proud of your achievement in saving HMS Waves crew. You represent the spirit and will of the townspeople who rushed to this task without question and triumphed in their efforts. I for one am proud of the small but tiny part I played in St Ives finest hour. So I thank today's town council to the mayor and Louise the town clerk for their hard work and commitment in remembering the townspeople of 1952 who opened their town to the rescued sailors and showed the world what selflessness really meant. This plaque is a fitting way to record these memorable events and the St Ives people who responded to the call. In the old Cornish language, Onan Hag Oil, one and all. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, shipmates, 
I thank you all very, very much indeed for giving me the honour and privilege of unveiling this plaque. <coughs> So that concludes the um, time at the moment. The veterans are going on to the lifeboat station now, and then we are inviting them back to the guild hall. remains of wave today are a few fragments of propeller tips picked up from the rocks and also this barnacle encrusted steel rim which guards the point where she ran aground and is still very much part of the shore.